Um, Desmond? So, Desmond, five minutes. I think that um, what you guys plan to do this afternoon is a huge waste of everyone's time, including your own, and you know that. But the reason I came is because I made a promise to some young people who were at a Children's Aid Toronto Black History Month event two months ago. I made a promise to those black kids and their families and their guardians and to the institution and through them to all young people in Toronto, but particularly black people, that I would stand up for them because you guys refuse to the way you're carrying on. Those black children that I'm talking to you about at Children's Aid are disproportionately in our city apprehended from their parents, those black children, disproportionately, to the tune of about 40% of the last numbers that we have. 40% of child welfare cases in Toronto involve black children, even though we're just a small fraction of the population. Those kids are getting disproportionately discriminated against in child welfare. They're getting disproportionately discriminated against in our schools, where this week we learned that almost half of the suspensions and expulsions at the Toronto District School Board are of black children. Almost 50% of a group that's what, 8, 9% of the population? So you keep failing our kids in child welfare, in education, and we know that the reason that everybody is exercised about carding is that it disproportionately affects my community also, but particularly our young people. And do you ever stop to think about the intersections between those things? Black children disproportionately taken away from our families. Black children disproportionately suspended and expelled from school. Black children disproportionately stopped and followed and documented by the police. And that that could be the same child three times. Do you think about things like that? I don't think you do enough because you guys are ready to move on. I made a very specific promise to those young people because the police still have access to carding data. Carding data that should never have been collected. Let's look at what the guidelines are from the province here, the rules and what they mean for you. As of January 1st, 2017, if a police officer asks you for your ID in a situation where the rules apply, they must have a reason which cannot be based on race, which acknowledges that your police did stop us based on race. It cannot be arbitrary, which acknowledges that it has been, which cannot only be because you are in a high crime area, which is a tacit acknowledgement that you have targeted our children just because they were in what you call a high crime area, and I call it their neighborhood. You cannot be targeted because you refused to answer a question or walked away. So you're tacitly admitting, admitting, and the province is tacitly admitting with, all, admitting with all of this, that this is what they've been doing. But the information that you gathered as a result of this illicit practice is still in the hands of the police chief or whomever the police chief designates. And you want to move on thinking that we're going to forget about that. There was never your information to take in the first place. And I'm old enough to come and sit here and represent myself and speak for myself, but the children who you did this to are not. And when the police chief said, when you passed your policy, that anybody who didn't like it can sue the police, was that what he was hoping? Was that thousands of black children, many of whom are already disenfranchised in child welfare, already disenfranchised in education? being disproportionately targeted by the police, does he expect that they're going to go get a lawyer now and sue the police? You have to, as a first step of all of the other things that we could talk about that have to do with the real elimination of carding forever, the one that you refuse to actually get on with, you have to restrict police access 
to that database of children's information and all people's information which should never have been collected. We've told you a thousand times. You've ignored us a thousand times. And the only reason that I have come here this afternoon is that I made a promise that I was going to stand up for kids because none of you will. And I do. I stand up for the children of this city that you guys refuse to protect, particularly the black children. And I plan to stand here in protest until you commit, until you commit today, here, and now to restricting the police having our information going forward. You're going to ruin another generation of children's lives, and I'm not going to allow you to do it. Thanks, Desmond. Yes. Colleagues, any questions for Desmond? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I got a question. Oh, sorry, Ken. Yeah. Um, in terms of communicating, um, first of all, like, how, how you do you propose that um, that carding be monitored, and um, how do you know when card, like in other words, what recourse do these young black people in particular have once they, if they consider themselves to be carded? I, I think it's pretty obvious that a lot of young people don't know what carding is. They're taught from a very young age to obey the police, and they want to do that. They don't want to get into trouble. So if a police officer approaches a young child and starts asking them for information, I feel like any reasonable child would think that that's something that their parents and their teachers and their community expects them to answer. So they might not understand later on that everything that they said, everything that they were asked was documented and was kept with their name. They might not understand that that might have happened to them multiple times. They don't have a recourse to protect themselves. Maybe I could be a little bit more specific. At 2 o'clock in the morning, if a young person, a young black person in particular is is stopped and feels that they illegally they're being carded. What recourse do they have in terms of bringing that bringing it to the attention of the authorities? I mean, I mean, you you, you guys should have that answer better than me, really. No. Uh, I I think that legally or officially, the recourse is that you can file a complaint with the OIPRD. Yeah, but a young person, as you know, would not necessarily have that information, no. right? And so what I'm asking is like, who and can be the intermediary to assist or support that young person? We have people in communities who have been doing that from time, who are working in community centers, who are working in programs with youth who are at risk, who are usually the ones on the front line who hear about these interactions that I'm talking to you about. And the youth workers are often the ones that relay the story because they're hearing from the young person, I had an interaction with the police that I'm not sure about. So they are the ones who are really the intermediaries in community right now in the absence of there being more protection for these young people. Okay, I'll just say that, like, I mean, there may be an inconsistency in, in, in that way of, of, of supporting the young people, so I'm just trying to understand. Because when we're talking about education and educating about the, the laws of the land, et cetera, et cetera, right? and what their rights are, and what recourse and options they have. I'm just trying to understand how would be the best way of communicating that to the young people. I, I, I can offer you a suggestion, but you're not going to like it. No, just offer me a suggestion. My suggestion is that you be honest with young people and tell them that they don't have any rights when the police stop them, that they have to do everything that the police says, because that's what my mom taught me growing up. Oh. My mom wanted me to come home safe. So my mom didn't tell me about section nine or section eight or about the new regulations. My mom told me that when the police talk to you, you do everything that they say, you don't have any rights. That would be what you could honestly tell kids because that's the truth. But you don't like that answer, I know you don't. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, okay, I don't like that. The, the point I'm saying is this, right? I'm trying to understand what is the responsibility of the community in helping and supporting those young people? No, no. We have to talk about the responsibility of the police not to put the kids in that situation. That's your job. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Um, 
That's why you're not here to tell the community how to mitigate the violence that the police. No, no I'm not talking about violence. telling the community. I'm talking about supporting the community. Well, why don't you? Why don't you have a real community meeting then? Because this is this is not that. Yeah, well, I'm asking, be asking for suggestions. That's why, in terms of. of well, no. If I had actually listened to the chair, I wouldn't be having this discussion with you right now because I would be All speaking right. to this instead of to sure. what I'm speaking to. So this is not a real community meeting, and a lot of the people who need to be in this room having this conversation right now are not here and I cannot speak for them. Okay. I'm speaking for myself. All right. Desmond, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? Okay, next slide. I'm not leaving. Uh, well, please have the courtesy to let the other people on the list no. speak. No, we, we can't uh, solve it that. Um, so let's, uh, let's adjourn the meeting for uh, uh, Ten minutes, please, and uh, board members.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, given the fact that uh, we cannot proceed with a properly constituted public meeting, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Councilor Carroll, seconded. Ms. Molnar, all in favor? Any contrary? Thank you very much. <laughs>